This is a video or video podcast that every horse owner, or even if you own any animal, you should probably watch this. It is that important. And, and that surrounds the issue of animal welfare. Now, through my career in academia and working with horse owners uh, around the world, animal welfare is one of these major issues that we all need to be aware of and we all need to improve of, I think. Um, as you're going to listen in this video, I'm going to talk about instances where, you know, I've made mistakes and animals weren't in the, uh, the best of care in that day until I made a correction and realized it. So I'm going to tell that story in a little bit, but starting this one off, going back to an early part of my career, I had just finished my PhD at Texas A&M and I was hired as a assistant professor at Clemson University. I was the state equine specialist. So South Carolina, a little less than 100,000 horses. And I was one of the experts there uh, for the owners to turn to for advice and for uh, any questions they might have. So I was young, energetic, excited to get out there, and, and, I, and I really enjoyed my time there. Met some wonderful people up and down the state, beautiful part of the, the country in the United States. Well, there's one morning I was sitting in my, my office, and, and back in the day, we had uh, telephone, telephone lines. Uh, some of you may have seen in movies, may have never uh, actually used a real old telephone, but I was sitting there, and my phone rang. And I was used to, to getting phone calls, you know, questions about weeds or, you know, one of the, as always nutrition, it seemed like. And um, this particular gentleman, I could hear, could all, was almost weeping on the phone. And I said, hello. And uh, I don't remember his name. Uh, could have been something like Bobby. And he said, you know, Dr. Mortensen, help me. They're taking my babies away from me. And I was like, okay, you know, can you just explain to me the situation? What, what is going on? And, and I was taken back a little bit because I, I'd used to getting phone calls, especially we were, you know, it was about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, going through a drought and people were asking me, you know, where can I find hay or my pastures are, are really suffering. What can I do? And this one just came out of nowhere. And I asked him to explain the situation and he said, you know, I had, he had three horses and he'd kept them in a paddock or he said pasture. And he said, I'm doing my best. I feed them every day. I, I love them. And I took down his name and number and I said, you know, I'm, I'm going to find out what's going on and I'll get back to you. So I in turn called uh, my friend who worked for the South Carolina Department of Agriculture, and uh, she said, Chris, these horses are in, are in terrible condition, body condition score of two, maybe three, uh, one of them. So that's, that's, that's a horse, skeletal horse, not much condition, not much muscling, really no fat on them at all. Uh, something you don't ever want to see. And I said, I understand. You know, he called me and she said, yes, he we had, we'd spoken to him previously and he said he would start feeding them more, but uh, what he was feeding them wasn't adequate. And we have to confiscate his animals. And, and wherever you live in the world with animal wel welfare laws, confiscating horses is, is a big deal. It's not something they take lightly, especially in the state of South Carolina in the United States. So what I, what I did, and I'll, and I'll, I'll finish the story at the end of the podcast but not to leave you hanging is I called him and I spoke to him great lengths talking about how to properly care for his animals. And when I look back on that situation, it wasn't willful negligence. He wasn't causing the animals to suffer. He just didn't understand that he wasn't meeting their welfare needs and he needed some intense education, which Sometimes you can't just get online or reading an article. So that's really the focus of this uh, 
a video podcast. And when you think of your animals or when you think of your horses, I really want you to, to think about this question and ponder it after the video or pause the video or when you're walking around your barn today or tomorrow or whenever you go. What do you consider a life worth living for a horse? That is the philosophical debate that has launched our modern animal welfare guidelines and laws, uh, again, around the world. So when you look at your horse, is their life worth living? And to go back on just one of the worst examples I had, obviously, when a horse is starving or kept in really terrible conditions, no, that is not life worth living, right? We need to up our welfare. And that is really the purpose of this. We're going to talk about not just the history of animal welfare, because I think that's important to, to, to show you where, how we've gotten to where we are today, but also, you know, where, where are our standards? So when you, you apply them, that the horse does have a life worth living because that's, that's what this you know, Mad About Horses podcast is about. That is what I'm about. That is my passion since I was a young boy was to fight for animals to have lives worth living, whether it was in veterinary medicine, whether it was my focus research to ensure horses were healthier and happier, my behavioral research to notice anything abnormal that we could fix. So again, we provide them with the, the, the best welfare. And it's your moral responsibility as a horse owner to provide your animals with the best life you can give them. And I see it all the time. And, and I'm going to talk about some stuff today, and I don't mean to trigger anybody or make anybody feel bad. I have interacted with thousands of horse owners educated tens of thousands of students to online courses or in-person courses. And I can honestly tell you, I think every single one I've ever interacted with always wants what's best for their animal. Sometimes it's just not understanding. Like that gentleman in South Carolina, he just didn't know. He just didn't know. He didn't have the life experience or the knowledge to go, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. It's the heat of summer. There is no grass in this paddock. It was a dry lot. And the little bits of hay I was giving them was not enough. And once you can talk to them, and they had plenty of water, by the way. It wasn't like he was, he was trying to kill them. It was just, hey, you need to feed them. Hey, you need to provide them with shelter. Hey, you need to deworm them and, and make sure their health's optimum. So these are the things we're going to talk about because it, it's a, not only a moral imperative, it's a legal requirement. Again, depending on where you live, as you watch this video, here in New Zealand, we have very, very strict welfare laws. When I lived in the United States, my whole career, strict welfare laws, people just weren't aware of them. So, you know, Europe, Asia, wherever you go, there are welfare laws and they're becoming more and more common across all the countries in the world to ensure these animals are living a life worth living. When we look at the history, and I know in these podcasts I do, I, I love the history because I think it's important to know where we've been and where we're going. And especially when I talk about the history of the horse, the horse deserves everything. They are our one companion in the world that has done more for us, not just our own evolution, but it's just like out, I was out yesterday working with them. It doesn't take much to get a horse to, to do what you ask of them. Obviously it takes some training, but for most horses, they're willing, they're willing to go with us. They're willing to walk with us. You know, they can't see but four feet in front of their face, but yesterday, you know, petting them on the nose, they, they trust us. And they give everything to us. So looking at welfare through the millennia and the centuries, I think can give you some insight into where we are today and why today I would argue horses have a, the best life they've ever had. 
you know, if we go back in history, even 60, 70, 80 years ago, horses were still charging across the battlefields of Europe at the outbreak of World War II, World War I, <laughs> just horrific uh, how many horses uh, died in those conflicts and then going back through human history. So they deserve it. But you know, the question is, is, is animal welfare a modern concern? Is this something that we've just come up with in the last few decades? Or has this been something that's been discussed for 200 years, 500 years? I dare say 2,000 years. And if you go back to the earliest times, if you can imagine in your head when horses were first domesticated, so roughly 5,500 years ago, Central Asia and your tribe or group of peoples has been able to domesticate these animals, breed them for a few generations, and you have an animal that you can ride and care for. How much welfare do you think they gave them? You know, we may think, oh, they treated them like dirt. But flip that on its head. These are prized possessions. <laughs> it is something very special. Even today, when you're around horses, and I think anybody that works with horses, you realize how special it is when you form that, that companionship, that, that tight bond. So we don't have anything written 4,000 years ago on the welfare of horses or even how they kept horses. We do have archaeological evidence, they were kept in some sort of paddocks or pastures, things like that. The point being, I probably could hedge my bets and say, horses were probably pretty well cared for 4,000 years ago. Pro didn't have the lifespans that we see today because our welfare is so much better, our understanding of nutrition is so much better, our understanding of their health and veterinary medicine is so much better. But 4,000 years ago, you can bet they were feeding them, they were watering them, they were ensuring they were getting exercise, because if you didn't, if you didn't take care of them, they would break down and die, or they couldn't, you couldn't ride them. And what use is that? Again, a prized possession. So if we accelerate a couple thousand years, again, this long, long time frame, let's just go to ancient Rome. And people have probably seen the movie Gladiator. There's a there's another one coming out soon, Gladiator 2. You go into this metropolis of a million hustle bustle city. Imagine you're a merchant man or woman, right? Your family business. And you have a horse that pulls a cart from Rome to the port city of Ostia. It's the closest port to, to Rome. And you are making pottery that you're exporting to Egypt and Egypt comes back with grain and or goods or fabrics or anything that you were making in Rome, right? And that horse in that cart, you would pull it, unload your wares, maybe do some trading, then come back to Rome, right? How do you think they treated those animals? Your entire livelihood depends on that horse being able to pull that cart not everybody had horses like, say, 150 years ago or 200 years ago, where that was like the major mode of transportation. Most everybody, you know, had some money, had some sort of horse or working animal with them. So back in 2000 years ago, they cared for their horses really well. There is evidence of them treating colic and other disorders that we, we have today. And they were really doing their best to care for them. So when we go back and look at these ancient civilizations and their animal welfare, some of it was religious based. So just as an example in Egypt, they, they, they glorified cats. And, and I know some people watch this videos. You love your cats. I mean, we love them. They actually mummified their cats in ancient Egypt and put them in their tombs with them 
because they they believe the cats would be with them in the afterlife. I mean, they they treated cats really really well. So animal welfare for cats was super high. When you look at specifically horses or their view of animals, the writings we have are the ancient Greeks, and they do talk a lot about the importance of caring for your horses, caring for your animals. You had a moral obligation. So this is over 2,000, 2,500 years ago. You had an early civilization like Greece saying, hey, we need to care for these animals, right? And Pythagoras, he, 2,500 years ago, was one of the world's first vegetarians that was written down. I'm sure there are other peoples like India and, and, and other religions. But I'm just saying in the written histories, especially in the Western civilization, he was a vegetarian because he saw animals as spiritual beings and he thought they had souls or he thinks they had souls and they're immoral. They get reincarnated and all these uh, different spiritual beliefs, but also saying and challenging the thoughts of the day that we really need to respect these non-human animals. And they, they call them subhuman, right? But they still understood that these animals needed some sort of welfare, some sort of moral protection against just animal abuse or something that you would think back in the day. And, and, and no, I mean, horses have for, for hundreds of years, for thousands of years have been well cared for, but you know, when, did it really change? When did it really become such a thing that it is today? It was in the early 1800s. And this was, this was surprising to me when I did some of the research on this for this topic with the formation of the SPCA. So the Society for the Pre Prevention of the Cruelty of Animals was founded in England in 1824. So 200 years ago, as I'm recording this, the SPCA was founded. And we see the SPCA in the United States, here in this part of the world, in Europe. And it all was due to carriage horses and the treatment of carriage horses. So some carriage drivers were abusing their animals. They weren't feeding them properly. They weren't watering properly. They were beating on them. And so in England, it was organized to this organization to stop this and push legislation and push people to treat their animals better. And this discussion has been going on for, you know, a, a couple hundred years at least. Now, to get into animal welfare, what it means and what it means to you, I want to do a thought experiment real quick. And again, not to trigger anybody, but I'm going to say a couple concepts and just, just what's your gut reaction? How do you feel about it? When I say animal rights, how does that make you feel? Okay. Different definitions, but quote, here's one. Animal right advocates believe that non-human animals should be free to live as they wish, without being used, exploited, or otherwise interfered with by humans. So that would, if you're a horse person, mean you can't ride your horse. Uh, to an extreme, you shouldn't own pets. Uh, so this is, the reason I'm doing this is because the next concept I want you to think of, because they are two separate concepts. And that's where I think some people, especially in the livestock industry or, or, or even farmers, you know, that, I, that I've worked with and talked with about animal welfare, they, they get angry. I'm like, no, you don't understand. This isn't an animal rights issue. This is an animal welfare. So what is, how does animal welfare make you feel? And a definition, I've, a very good paper, the Canadian Vet Journal. Uh, 
20 years ago, actually, but it's what is animal welfare, common definitions and their practical consequences? Because again, we've been talking about this for a few decades. And in the paper, it said, quote, thus the most widely accepted definition of animal welfare is that it comprises the state of the animal's body and mind and the extent to which its nature, which its genetic traits manifest in breed and temperament is satisfied, end quote. So there are two separate concepts. Animal welfare is, is really about how we care for them. So just bear with me. We're going to get to the standards, the gold standards today. But I want to tell you a, a quick story. And to give you a broad view of the world and animal welfare around the world, I recently uh, took a trip to the island of Vanuatu. Very, very lucky, blessed to be able to visit there. Wonderful people, beautiful country. Like, wow, I, I can't believe I, I went there in the South Pacific. And in that trip, uh, my partner, my wife, she really wanted to ride horses on the beach. And I was very interested. I wanted to see these island horses. I, again, have been very lucky to, to, to travel around the world to different countries I definitely want to see more of the world. And I've seen horses in some not such ideal conditions. Now, again, in my backyard, when I was in South Carolina, when I lived in Florida, Texas, California, I've seen horses not in the best of, of condition. But going to a, a nation that's not as rich as, say, the United States or places like Canada and Europe and, and others, I was a little hesitant. And I was like, I'm not going to get on the back of a horse if I think that horse is malnourished, thin, uh, small, because I'm a big person, uh, very tall, and not cared for. You know, that's my moral compass. I, there's no way I would get on a horse like that. And I've been on a lot of trail horses through my career. And I've been able to see them. And I know how they behave. And, and they just, you know, they follow in the line. They do this day in, day out. I'm going to tell you what. I got there. These horses were in pristine condition not perfect but near perfect uh, the equipment was a little dated that was fine these horses had good cover body cover so good body condition their hooves looked great i watched them for a while behavior very few horses were agitated by each other they didn't appear stressed they were it was hot so they were all under trees uh, the ride was not strenuous. It was a short 45-minute ride around the island and on the beach. At the end of it, uh, we were able to take our horses into the water, you know, hand let them into the water so they could cool off a little bit. Even though it was like bath water, it still can cool off a little bit. And then I talked to the workers there. Horses are fed uh, a grain concentrate that they could get in there. They were given free access to all the pasture they wanted, had some supplemental hay, and when we left, they said they, they open up uh, the paddocks and let the horses roam on the beach so the horses can go in the water if they want, get out. They had plenty of water. Uh, they just looked in great condition. So what that said to me was, you know, wherever you are in the world, animal welfare is a concern. And, and um, you know, Vanuatu and probably other Caribbean islands I've been to, and, and, and I'm sure many of you have seen it where horses are loved and cared for. So that was, that was very uh, heartening. And I was, and I was glad, I was glad to be there and, and, and pet their animals and, and be with them. Now, the modern animal welfare standards and guidelines really in the 20th century, animal welfare becomes a science not just a moral philosophical discussion like the ancient Greeks or in Roman times, or even in the middle ages. This was a, a time when science uh, was propelled after world war two. And I've talked about this in other podcasts and stuff. And it was like, one of the things was evaluating stress. And, and anytime I see that I, I get interested because that was part of my PhD work was looking at stress in, in mares and trying to reduce it, right? That's just something we, we don't want. So in, you know, a little bit in the, in the 1800s, but in the 1900s, and then after World War II, 1950s, 1960s, 
the foundation of equitation science or equine science, and then just animal science, our understanding of biology and how animals react with their environments has, in great, has, has increased greatly. And ethology, you know, ethics, and then neuroscience was a becoming more of a standard discipline. So this led to the development of the foundation of the five freedom model of animal welfare. That has morphed into now today in 2024, the five domains. So this is the bread and butter. This is the bread and butter of this podcast, this video on what you really need to, to understand because you need to apply these principles for your horses. The Five Freedoms was developed in the UK in the 1950s and the 60s. It was only formalized until the 1970s. But I think if we listen to what the Five Freedoms are, I think you could agree that, yeah, this, is, this makes sense. This makes sense for every animal that, that's under human care. Uh, the Five Freedoms are freedom from hunger and thirst, freedom from discomfort, freedom from pain, injury, and disease, freedom to express normal behavior, and freedom from fear and distress. And these concepts have morphed. They've, in just the last 40, 30, well, really 20, 30 years. This is applied across zoos. I've worked with zoos around the world many friends that work in the zoo industry. So when you look at how zoos have changed in the last 20, 30, 40 years of my lifetime, a lot of this is because of their animal care, good zoos, certified zoos, not sideshow zoos, but I'm talking about the big ones, San Diego Zoo, Cincinnati Zoo, Berlin Zoo, London Zoo, Auckland Zoo. Uh, the five uh, domains is is how they operate, right? So they, they always are worried about animals with that. What really pushed the freedoms more into the domains that I'm going to mention here in a second is the recognition that animals are sentient beings. Now, that may trigger some people. They may go, what? What is a sentient being? What do you mean? Because we can't anthropomorphize. They're not human, right? Even human-like primates, like chimpanzees, very intelligent. Uh, dolphins, very intelligent, but then there's that scale, right? But sentient, and just to quote what is sentience, sentience is the ability to feel a range of emotions and feelings, such as pleasure, pain, joy, and fear. Some animals even experience complex emotions such as grief and empathy, Animals are sentient beings, and that means their feelings matter. I'm currently in New Zealand. In 2015, New Zealand recognized animals are sentient. So that is why we have some very strict animal welfare laws, and things are always changing here. I go back to, I forgot which podcast it was, but I asked my class 10 years ago, roughly, in an animal ethics class, do animals have feelings? Over 50 of the students laughed. It, like, it, like that was some absurd uh, comment. Like, what? No, they don't have feelings. And I, you know, it was a teaching moment for me to, to, to educate them. And, you know, I, I gave them some examples. So for horses, what's a whinny? When a horse whinnies, why? Why are they winning? What does that mean? Is it just some random vocalization? Are they feeling something and they vocalize like, hey, buddy, way over there. You're, you're walking away from me. Could be stress or, hey, you're coming towards me. Excitement. How about a knicker between a, a mare and a foal? Saw it yesterday. Isn't that bonding? Isn't that, it's not a whinny it's not, or a scream or like, ah, it's not some random vocalization. It is a feeling of closeness and bonding between you know, mother and child, mare and foal. What happens when a horse pins their ears back? What does that mean? They're happy? They're angry, right? 
that's an emotion. That's emotions. So obviously, yes, of course, animals have emotions. They do. Now, are they human complex thinking machines? No. No, not yet. I mean, I'm, we're not even as intelligent as we can be. I guarantee you humans are going to be so different in a thousand years. But they still have thought processes. They still display fear. They still display love. They still display affection. And then when you talk about more complex animals like elephants who mourn their dead, we know they mourn their dead. They return. They don't, they walk across random elephant bones. Uh, they may sniff them for a while and walk off. Scientists have, have observed like the old matriarch because it's a matriarch, matriarchal society has died and the herd will divert every year and go by those bones, pick them up in their trunks, taste them, smell them, and they'll mourn for hours, paying their respects, and then they'll walk back off. And scientists have observed this. So, yeah, sentience. So that has pushed the five freedoms, which is a, a great start compared to really no animal welfare laws before the 1970s, 60s, 50s to now the five domains. And what does this mean to you as a horse owner? So the five domains are nutrition, physical environment, health, behavioral interactions, mental state. Uh, this was uh, created by uh, Meller and Reed, Drs. Meller and Reed here in New Zealand, um, back in 1994. And now these are the recognized gold standard today of animal welfare. So mental state, that fifth one is always overriding the previous four. So I'm going to go through each one, talk about what that means to you as a horse owner, and then we'll tie all this up. Now I opened up this podcast talking about Jimmy down in South Carolina, downstate for me. And had some ribby thin horses. I've seen it in other places. So when we talk about nutrition as one of the domains, this is one I've accidentally, not, not so much me, my, my university when I was working at. So I was working there every day. And it wasn't done purposefully, but we did violate domain one. It was in central California which in the summers, anybody that lives there has been there. It's brutally hot, 100, 110 degrees. That's like 38, 39C, maybe 40C. And it's a dry heat, but it's still hot. So horses need plenty of shade. But we had these, uh, not stalls, we, we had these paddocks for outside mares that were off to the side. So we had a herd of mares for breeding and then we always brought in outside mares and we had this mare and foal in and we had those automatic waters along the fence line, which were great when they were great, but this one didn't. This was the older models where you, the horse had to learn how to push the tongue. So it's like this half moon shape and behind it is the tongue and the horse had to push it to get more water. Well, this mare, didn't understand that. She flipped it up. They're very tactile with their lips. She picked it up, lifted up to get at whatever little bit of water was left. So she had pretty much not had water all day. Nursing mare, mind you. So I still feel horrible to this day about this. Later that evening during feeding, we noticed she had no water. And we flipped it back, you know, pushed water. She immediately went over there and drank. Um, but we violated freedom from thirst or nutrition, the domain of nutrition. We were feeding her fine, but water is a critical, critical element. And that mare probably suffered a little bit that day. And, and it, it's awful. But what we did, we recognized it and we corrected it. So not only did we try to show her how to do the water, but we brought in a, a big container, um, a big tub and filled it up with water every day so she could drink out of there as an emergency. And then we showed her how to get fresh water. So it was an important lesson for me, especially early in my career, to understand that your automatic waterers, you need to check twice a day. Now, for horse owners, nutrition is the cornerstone of equine management. I mean, that is the most critical thing. And 
I talk about it all the time, how most of the research you see being produced today for equids is surrounded nutrition because it's really critical to their health. Uh, and it's really critical to their ability to perform and do these things that we ask them to do. And it's important to, you know, longevity in their life. So the, the idea from a well force welfare standpoint is that the horses are fed properly, have free access to water and their nutrition is optimum for them, their health, their genetics. So I think most of us uh, ensure horses have enough water to drink, eat enough food, feeding them enough, keeping them in proper body condition. Their diets are balanced. So if they're on a hay diet, they might need some supplements. You know, I'd, I would say almost every horse needs some sort of supplement because forage is deficient in something, always is. Uh, eats a variety of foods. You know, and, and, and it's correct quantity. So we're not feeding them once a day. I know a lot of us can only feed twice a day, but ideally, you know, if, if the top, top standard, you feed them four or five times a day. Do you know what a lot of, a lot of people can do? Now, where mental state, remember, that's the fifth. So nutrition's one, mental state's over all of these. The mental state of nutrition, so horses have enough water to drink to quench their thirst. They don't suffer any hunger. So unless it's medically, uh, you know, veterinarians will say withhold water or withhold, you know, food, especially like experiencing colic or something like that. Always listen to your veterinarian. But in general, day-to-day uh, -day operations, you want to make sure they're freedom from hunger, they're freedom from uh, thirst, and they don't suffer gastrointestinal comfort. So we can even push it a little bit and say how you manage them to try to reduce incidence of colic because that's a, that's a number one killer of horses under 20. But, you know, in general, make sure you're feeding them properly and they have plenty of water. So that, that covers that domain. Now, environment is the next big concern for horse owners because, yeah, we want to feed them, but now where do we house them? These are large animals. We can't put them in our backyards unless we own lots of land, but, you know, they can't put them in our homes generally. Some people do. But housing for horses. So to kind of, again, think about it in your head, what does a horse really need to be, say, happy? Okay, because that mental state's important. But when you think about it in environment, what does a horse need? We're thinking about housing. A horse pasture, sure. They, that they live on the plains in the world. That's their, their natural state. What about in that pasture? So if you're thinking of ideal conditions, because we stalling is not usually ideal for the horse. It's ideal for us because we do want to train and compete with them. But that's, again, that's where that turnout time is really critical uh, and part of their environment. So they need turnout time. Or if they're kept in paddocks, they have enough room to, to exercise a little bit. But let's just say pasture, you know, ideal. What would they need out there? Obviously, access to water. They have plenty of grass to eat because uh, that keeps them busy, right? Mental health, that mental state and environment. What about shade or shelter? And I, whenever I talked about this, I've seen horses and everybody listening or seen this video. It's probably seen horses in the heat of the day. They're out grazing. They're out grazing. Eh, sun's on their back in the heat of Florida, in the heat of South Carolina, in the heat of Texas, I've seen a lot of horses just graze throughout the day. But I remember one mare, whenever we brought her up for breeding and, and working on her and doing things, and then every time we ran them back to the, the pasture, this mare went straight for the shade. She went straight for the big shade we had in the heat of the day of Texas in the summer where it's brutally hot, brutally humid, and she would just sit under there to cool off and get out of the sun. And she couldn't sweat as well, so had some anhydrosis going on. That's a condition where horses can't sweat so well. But her environment, she needed shade, right? So in the heat of summer, you should provide horses with some shade, or in the cold of winter, they should have some sort of shelter uh, from the winds, uh, from the cold. So 
when you think about it, yeah, what does a horse need? But how do we again get to that mental state where it's optimum for the animal? And one of the things I talked about in the day in the life of a horse podcast, and if you haven't listened to that, it's, it's how they spend their days, what horses should be doing all day. In there, I talked about a study out of Tunisia where it was looking at horses, mares, tightly packed in paddocks, very, very tightly packed. And it was, it was one of the worst situations I could think of for, for holding horses. And there was a lot of stress behaviors, um, less, not much eating, horses were fighting. It just, it was awful. Reading that study, you're, you're understanding they were doing it to say, hey, your situation is awful. Change it, please. But that is that is definitely violating uh, the second tenor of the five domain models environment. So one of the things is you want to think about is when Meller, we go back to Meller and Reed in these five domains, thermally tolerable. So again, shade or shelter. If it's cold, shade, if it's hot, they have enough substrate. So if you're stalled, obviously you feed them lots of hay. And then that brings me to health. Health is a major responsibility for, for every horse owner, uh, not just morally, but legally, depending on where you live in the world. And it can be expensive. I mean, just yesterday, I was talking to a horse owner, Haley, she's wonderful, wonderful, just loves her horses. I mean... And we're laughing and she's showing me her babies and talking about her mares and her facility. And she's just talking about, you know, her husband supports her crazy hobby. And I laugh and I'm like, I know that feeling for me, you know, supporting my crazy hobbies. And, you know, we got talking about vet bills and veterinary medicine and, and how things are changing. And she's like, I lose money on my horses every year. I'm, I'm spending tons to keep them because I love them. And we were talking about a mare that had colic and how it cost her so much money and, um, you know, and how she, she altered her, her feeding schedule and how she changed things, her management, because she never had colic before. She's had horses for 20, 30 years. But she understood caring and the health of her animals was, was a priority, right? It, it's, and I've met so many horse owners, you watching, I, I, it, it is, we, we just, we, pay our veterinarians to, to care for these animals as much as we can. And, you know, how much equestrian spend podcast, I talk about vet care. I mean, there's the day-to-day -day care or the, the yearly vaccines and things that you need to do. Uh, but one of the things I mentioned was equine insurance. So look into that, you know, so when something catastrophic does come along, it doesn't bankrupt you, you know, so, so just a piece of advice I always give, but when it comes to health, it's just animals are free from disease, free from injury, or if they do notice any injuries or disease, they are treated. Um, they're functional, and you're just very careful uh, to maintain it. So they need to be dewormed, you know, check for parasites. If they have parasites, then you deworm them. Make sure they're getting their vaccinations. So they don't get things like tetanus, which can be really bad. Uh, it depends on where you live in the world, rabies, especially in the United States. Uh, those parts of the world, you want to make sure horses don't get that. West Nile virus, that's a big one in the United States and other parts of the world. So you want to make sure you check with your veterinarian and get your horses uh, checked. Teeth, see equine dentists or talk to your veterinarian about that. Um, overall health and obviously hoof health is a big one for horse owners. Make sure you're working with your farrier. You're getting those feet trimmed or if you're trimming them, you, you know how to do it properly. So all of that is important. And then again, that mental state, if you could imagine with health, just us, if we don't, if we have an injury, how do we feel mentally? You know, if we're sick, how do we feel? It, we feel awful. Our mental state's awful. So you can only imagine how the horse, horses feel when their health isn't optimum. So that's again, where that, that fifth domain that mental state comes in with health. And then the final one is behavior. And this is just allowing a horse to act like a horse. It's important to understand how they do. And then, then it's also important to understand how they don't act normally with those abnormal behaviors. And this is an upcoming, upcoming podcast uh, because it's such a, a key issue. 
things like cribbing, stall weaving, uh, wood chewing, pacing, aggression towards you or other horses, abnormal aggression. It's These are all abnormal behaviors that's probably due to their welfare. We know horses pick up cribbing uh, when they're bored or they start chewing wood or they do these things because they've installed too long or they're upset. They're angry. They're trying to uh, get that aggression out somehow. So uh, we see it, stereotypic behaviors. We're going to talk about those soon. So that is a welfare issue. Uh, when you see it and, and then trying to cure it, I know cribbing is a brutally hard one. I've seen study after study. How do you stop a horse from cribbing? I've dealt with a couple of cribbers. It's, it's, it's one of those uh, addictions that are very tough to break. And maybe I'll talk about that in a, in a future podcast. But, you know, in the day-to-day -day life of a horse, not only allowing them to act like a horse, but getting that exercise, um, observing them day-to-day. -day. That's why every horse owner, or let's say you board your horses somewhere, at least somebody is getting eyes on that animal once or twice a day. I would say twice a day, morning and evening at least, to make sure your animal's healthy and happy. Because things like colic, you want to pick up early so they can get treatment early. Again, just yesterday, touring that facility near me with Haley, oh, her horses were just, it was so great watching her horses rub in the dirt, you know, flies are really bad summer here. But they were relaxed, uh, relaxed with each other. Foals running with moms. Uh, the foals looked bright and sprightly. Moms were in great condition. They were just horses, horses acting like horses. And it was beautiful to see. And that's just, that's great. That's what you want to see. It's the lethargic, the sad, the injured. Uh, those are the horses that, that it's a welfare concern. So then again, when a horse can act like a horse, or they're in a very stressful situation, that's where you start to see some of these stereotypies develop, you know, or you know, boredom. They're just bored. And again, that mental state. So the five domains, again, the nutrition, the environment, the health, the behavior, and the mental state. So those are the five keys in animal welfare. And those are the five keys or the five golden rules. You know, you can still go to the freedoms because the freedoms help guide you into the domains, but that is where the gold standard is today. And if you are struggling like Jimmy was, and you have experts around you or your veterinarians or people you trust to give you good advice, talk to them. You know, things if like you're looking for assistance with nutrition, that is a very hard one. I would urge you go to madbarn.com, top right, analyze diet, click it, it's free. Have, have our experts analyze your diet, get back to you and say, hey, your diet looks great, you're doing everything right, or hey, you're probably missing some stuff, or hey, maybe add a little bit more hay. So talk to the experts. I mean, you're, that's, that's PhDs and veterinarian nutritionists. So you're talking to, to the experts in the world. But when it comes to environment and you have any concerns, I've, you know, concerns about where you're keeping your horse, you know, seek help, seek advice. You know, if you're stalling them somewhere and things don't look quite right to you, talk to the barn manager, you know, maybe ask questions, but then, you know, seek some outside advice if you need to. You know, to finish this story with, with Jimmy, he did get his horses back, but it, it was a few months later. The horses went to a rescue uh, where they were fed. They were able to put on some condition. But the last I heard, he was able to get his horses back. Um, it was a very difficult lesson for him, and then they were monitoring him. And then I, I ended up moving out of state, going down to the University of Florida, but it was a, a, a moment in my career where I was faced with an ethical dilemma where I didn't know if like, ooh, I don't know if you should own horses, but he was very sincere and he was in tears and, and, and the em empath in me was, all right, let's try to do some education. And I sent him a, a bunch of information, uh, 
sat down on the phone. I didn't ever meet him face to face, but sat down over the phone, talked to him, developed a feeding plan, a management plan, had a veterinarian involved, and he was able to get his animals back. And, and hopefully he, he, he kept up with the care that those horses deserved because he was getting inspections every now and then. And it's something I think we all, again, can do better at every day. How can I improve my horse's life? How can I get to it to where it's a life worth living? 